Welcome to Country Studies. We shall continue speaking about the United Kingdom. Lecture 12 will be devoted to social behavior and attitudes observed in the United Kingdom. Speaking about social behavior and attitudes, we'll cover the following topics. National and regional identities, that is ethnic identity, the native British geographical identity, also, we shall speak about social class and their attitudes to stereotypes and change, multiculturalism, the love of nature and national passion, and also the social importance of sport. National or ethnic loyalties can be strong among the people in Britain whose ancestors were not English. The same people living in England who call themselves Scottish, Welsh and Irish this loyalty is little more than a matter of emotional attachment. But for others it goes a bit further and they may even join one of the sporting or social clubs for these nations. These clubs promote national folk music, organize parties on special national days and foster a consciousness of doing things differently from the English. For people living in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, the way that ethnic identity commonly expresses itself varies. People in Scotland have constant reminders of their distinctiveness. First, several important aspects of public life are organized separately and differently from the rest of Britain, notably education, law and religion. Second, the Scottish way of speaking English is very distinctive. A modern form of the dialect known as Scots is spoken in everyday life by most of the working classes in the lowlands. It has many features which are different from other forms of English. It cannot usually be understood by people who are not Scottish. Third, there are many symbols of Scottishness which are well known throughout Britain. On 25th of January every year, many Scottish people attend Burns suppers. At these parties, they read from the work of the 18th century poet Robert Burns, regarded as Scotland's national poet, where Celts sing traditional songs, dance traditional dances, and eat traditional food. The people of Wales do not have as many reminders of their Welshness in everyday life. The organization of public life is identical to that in England nor are there as many well-known symbols of Welshness. In addition, a large minority of the people in Wales probably do not consider themselves to be especially Welsh at all. In the 19th century, large numbers of Scottish, Irish and English people went to Wales to find work, and today many English people still make their homes in Wales and have holiday houses there. As a result, a feeling of loyalty to Wales is often similar in nature to their fairly weak loyalties to particular geographical areas found throughout England. It is regional rather uh, than nationalistic. However, there is one single highly important symbol of Welsh identity, the Welsh language. Every day in Wales can speak English. But it is not every day's first language. For about 20% of the population, the mother tongue is Welsh. For these people, Welsh identity obviously means more than just living in the region known as Wales. The question of identity in Northern Ireland is a really complex subject. As for English identity, most people who describe themselves as English usually make no distinction in their minds between English and British. There is plenty of evidence of this. For example, at international football or rugby matches, when the players stand to attention to hear their national anthem, the Scottish, Irish and Welsh have their own songs, while the English one is just God save the Queen, the same as the British national anthem. A sense of identity based on place of birth is like family identity not very common and strong in most parts of Britain. People are just too mobile and very few live in the same place all their lives. 
there is quite a lot of local pride and people find more opportunities to express it. This pride, however, arises because people are happy to live in what they consider to be a pe nice place and often when they are fighting to preserve it. It does not usually mean that people of a locality feel strongly and they belong to that place. A sense of identity with a large geographical area is a bit stronger. Nearly everybody has a spoken accent that identifies them as a coming from a particularly large city or region. In some cases, there is quite a strong sense of identification. For example, Cockneys from London, Geordies from the Newcastle area, and uh, they are proud to be known by these names. In other cases, identity is associated with the county. These are the most ancient divisions of England. Although their boundaries and names do not always confirm to be modern arrangement of local government, they still claim the allegiance of some people. Yorkshire is the north of England, is a notable example. Another is Conwell, in the southwest corner of England. Even today, some Cornish people still talk about going to England when they cross the country border. Many English people see themselves as either northerners or southerners. Historians say that the class system has survived in Britain because of its flexibility. It has always been possible to buy or marry or even work your way up so that your children and their children belong to a higher social class than you do. As a result, the class system has never been swept away by a revolution and an awareness of class forms a major part of most people's sense of identity. People in modern Britain are very conscious of class differences. They regard it as difficult to become friends with somebody from a different class. This feeling has little to do with conscious loyalty and nothing to do with a positive belief in the class system itself. Most people say they do not approve of class divisions, nor does it have very much to do with political or religious affiliations. It results from the fact that the different classes have different sets of attitudes and daily habits. Typically, they tend to eat different food at different times of day. They like to talk about different topics using different styles and accents of English. They enjoy different pastimes and sports. They have different values about what things in life, are, in life are most important and different ideas about the correct way to behave. Stereotypically, they go to different kinds of schools. The English grammar and vocabulary, which is used in public speaking, radio and television news broadcasts, books and newspapers, is known as Standard British English. Most working class people, however, use lots of words and grammatical forms in their everyday speech, which are regarded as non-standard. Nevertheless, nearly everybody in the country is capable of using standard English when they judge that situation demands it. They are taught to do so at school. Therefore, the clearest indication of person's class is often his or her accent. Most people cannot change this convincingly to suit the situation. The most prestigious accent in Britain known as received pronunciation. It is a combination of standard English spoken with and received pronunciation accent that is usually meant when people talk about BBC English or Oxford English or the Queen's English. Received pronunciation is not associated with any particular part of the country. The vast majority of people, however, speak with an accent which is geographically limited. In England and Wales, anyone who speaks with a strong regional accent is automatically assumed to be working class. And conversely, anyone with an received pronunciation accent is assumed to be upper or upper middle class. In general, the different classes mix more readily and easily with each other than we, they used to. 
there has been a great increase in the number of people from working class origins who are house owners and who do traditionally middle class jobs. The lower and middle classes have drawn closer to each other in their attitudes. The British, like the people of every country, tend to be attributed with certain characteristics which are supposed typical, that is, stereotyped images of the British. Societies change over time while the reputations lag behind. Many things which are often regarded as typical of British derive from books, songs or plays which were written a long time ago and which are no longer representative of modern life. One example of this is the popular belief that Britain is a land of tradition. This is what most tourist brochures claim. The claim is based on what can be seen in public life and on centuries of political continuity. And at this level, the level of public life, it is undoubtedly true. The annual ceremony of the state opening of parliament, for instance, carefully follows customs which are centuries old. So does the military ceremony of trooping the color. Likewise, changing of the guard outside Buckingham Palace never changes. There are many examples of supposedly typical British habits which are simply not typical anymore. For example, the traditional breakfast or British breakfast. In fact, only 10% of the people in Britain actually have this sort of breakfast. And the image of the British as a nation of tea drinkers is another stereotype which is somewhat out of date. It is true that it is still prepared in a distinctive way, strong and with milk, but more coffee than tea is now brought into the country's shops. Because English culture dominates the cultures of the other three nations of the British Isles, everyday habits, attitudes and values among the peoples of the four nations are very similar. However, they are not identical and what is often regarded as typically British may in fact be only typically English. This is especially true with regard to one notable characteristic, anti-intellectualism. Among many people in Britain, there exists a suspicion of intelligence, education and high culture. Teachers and academic staff, also respected, do not have as high a status as they do in most other countries. Nobody normally proclaims the academic qualification or title to the world at large. No professor would expect or want to be addressed as professor on any but the most formal occasion. There are large sections of both the upper and working class in Britain who traditionally haven't encouraged their children to go to university. This lack of enthusiasm for education is certainly decreasing. Nevertheless, it is still unusual for parents to arrange extra private tuition for their children, even among those who can easily afford it. Evidence of this attitude can be found in all four nations of the British Isles. However, it is probably better seen as a specifically English characteristic, not a British one. The Scottish have always placed a high value on education for all classes. The Irish of all classes place a high value on being quick, ready and able with words. The Welsh are famous for exporting teachers to other parts of Britain and beyond. Britain is a multicultural society. There are areas of London, for example, in which a distinctively Indian way of life predominates, with Indian shops, clothes, Indian languages. Because in the local schools up to 90% of the pupils may be Indian, a distinctively Indian style of learning tends to, to take place. These new British people have brought widely differing sets of attitudes with them. For example, while some seem to care no more about education for their children than people in traditional English culture, others seem to care about it. However, the divergence from indigenous British attitudes in new British communities is constantly narrowing. 
these communities sometimes have their own newspapers, but none have their own TV stations as they do in the United States. There, the numbers of such communities are large and the physical space between them and other communities is greater, so that it is possible for people to live their whole lives in such communities without ever really learning English. This hardly ever happens in Britain. In fact, the new British have made their own contribution to British life and attitudes. They have probably helped to make people more informal. They have changed the natural of the corner shop, the most popular, well-attended festival in the whole of Britain. Most of the British live in towns and cities, but they have an idealized vision of the countryside. To the British, the countryside has almost none of the negative associations which it has in some countries, such as poor facilities, a lack of educational opportunities, unemployment and poverty. To them, the countryside means peace and quiet, beauty, good health and no crime. Most of them would live in a country village if they thought that they could find a way of earning a living there. Ideally, this village would consist of cottages built around an area of grass known as a village green. Nearby, there would be a pond with ducks on it. Nowadays, such villages is not actually very common, but it is a stereotypical picture that is well known to the British. Even if they cannot get into the countryside, many British people still spend a lot of their time with nature. They grow plants. Gardening is one of the most popular hobbies in the country. Even those unlucky people who do not have a garden can participate. Each local authority owns several areas of land, which it rents very cheaply to these people in small parcels. There, people grow mainly vegetables. Nearly half of the households in Britain keep at least one domestic pet. Most of them do not bother with such grand arrangements when their pets die, but there are millions of informal graves in people's back gardens. Moreover, the status of pets is taken seriously. It is, for example, illegal to run over a dog in your car and then keep on driving. You have to stop and inform the owner. But the love of animal goes beyond sentimental attachment to domestic pets. Wildlife programs are by far the most popular kind of television documentary. Millions of families have bird stables in their gardens. These are raised platforms on which birds can feed safe from local cats during the winter months. There is even a special hospital which treats injured wild animals. Thousands of people are enthusiastic bird watchers. This is British pastime often involves spending hours lying in wet and cold undergrowth trying to get a glimpse of some rare species. Sport probably plays a more important part in people's life in Britain than it does in most other countries. For a very large number, and this is especially true for men, it's their main form of entertainment. Millions take part in some kind of sport at least once a week. Many millions more are regular spectators and follow one or more sports. There are hours of televised sport each week. Every newspaper, national or local, quality or popular, devotes several pages entirely to sport. The British are only really the best in the world at particular sports in modern times. However, they are one of the best in the world in a much larger number of different sports than any other country. The British are so fond of competitions that they even introduce it into gardening. Many people indulge in an informal rivalry with their neighbors as to who can grow the better flowers or vegetables. There is a similar situation with animals. There are hundreds of dogs and cats shows throughout the country at which owners hope their pet will win a prize. 
Almost every sport which exists is played in Britain, as well as the sports already mentioned like football, cricket, rugby. Hockey is quite popular as well, and both basketball for men and netball for women are growing in popularity. The British have a preference for team games, individual sports such as athletics, cycling, gymnastics and swimming have comparatively small followings. Large numbers of people become interested in them only when British com competitors do well in international events. There are some comprehension questions for you to be done in written form and sent to Google Classroom. Thank you for your interest in country studies and stay tuned to our YouTube channel.